Okay, we're starting now in our uh, chapter 8 of our book on the Virtuous Woman Experience. I'm very excited. I was talking to Dr. Kay Fairchild, and she's starting today on teaching on the Virtuous Woman. So, looking forward to hearing what she says. She's posted some things on Facebook that was very good on her page. And uh, I know, uh, I told her, I said, don't you dare start teaching better than me so people stop listening to me. And she, first she said, well, that's hard to do. <laughs> I think she was kidding, but she didn't laugh. She she gives me funny things, and then she just waits to see if I laugh. <laughs> but, you know, we need to hear it from her. We need to hear it through many, many voices, and it's going to be really good. So I encourage you to start listening to Dr. K. Fairchild if you listen on the Internet. Uh, we're in a section now where it says she buys a field. And I always wondered what that meant in my <laughs> younger years. I just never could figure out what it meant that she buys a field. And we're going to see that here. But the study on the versus woman experience, I just want to remind everybody, it's a vital teaching for all people in every age and for all genders. I was talking to somebody the other day that told me I need to publish this, and I asked them to help me come up with a title for it because I think if a book like this was in a library or whatever, and a man looked at it and said the versus woman experience, I think they probably wouldn't read it because of their perception of what it's about. But we know it's about the brain and the intellect. So everyone has some kind of thoughts they have information and beliefs in his or her brain that needs correction right everybody does there's not one person that i know of today that that can boldly stand up and say there's not something in my brain that i still need to be free from because if there was i believe that that person if, if i could if i stood up there and say there's not a thing in my brain that doesn't need to be replaced with the truth then I should be able to go to the nations and set the captive free. Now I am with the word, but I mean I should be able to lay hands on the person that is dying and say rise up and take your bed and walk. Because when that happens, I believe we're going to be able to do that. We are able to now. I'm not saying we're not able to, but we're going to be able to because we know that we can. That's why I always refer back to that man that Jesus said, do you believe? And he said, yes, Lord, I believe and help me in my unbelief. So it's not that we don't have the understanding, but it's that there's still wrong understanding there. Does that make sense? Yes. We do have the understanding because the Bible says we have an unction of the Holy One and we know all things. So the problem is there's still some wrong understanding. Uh, the biggest one is that we beat ourselves up still. Oh, yes. That's the biggest one. And, and that's why the Lord told me a long time ago when I was beating myself up for vanilla ice cream, He said, quit fighting it because that's your enemy. Now, those of you that just listened to this beginning, I'm joking about that, but that's all I'm going to confess. That's all I want to talk about. But when I beat myself up, then it becomes a power, right? When you resist something, that's why Scripture says, resist ye not evil. In other words, if something presents itself to be evil, don't resist it. Don't fight it, because if you fight it, you're giving it a power, right? Yep. And what were we taught to do all of our life? Fight, bind, rebuke, oh, yeah. you know? Resist, God, when are you going to take this away from me? And the very fact that we're saying, God, when are you going to take it away from me? We're saying that it has a power over us. Now, even though but we've given it a power, it is not a power. It's illegal. So, 2 Timothy 3.16, when I said that there needs to be some correction done in our thoughts, 2 Timothy 3.16 confirms that. It says, all scripture is divinely breathed of Father God and helpful advantageous for instruction to teach, for persuasion, for straightening up again, for educating or training in equity of character and justification. That's the translation of that. And I think that is very good because we do need to be persuaded. We do need teachers. Contrary to what people say today, everybody needs teachers. We need people to help us. I have teachers in my life, and I will always have teachers in my life. I'll never go along and say, okay, I know enough, I need no man. Now, I don't need somebody to to uh, provide the studies for me anymore like Brother Garner did. I don't need to transcribe anymore to learn. I am able to discern it myself now. I'm able to sit down because I can hear the Father. That's the big key right now I think in my life and has been for quite a few years is when I sit down to write and study, I hear His voice. And if you hear His voice, you're going to hear truth, are you not? So I don't have to depend on what men used to say. I don't have to read Matthew Henry's commentary or what other people said. I don't have to receive seed from everybody that comes down the pike anymore because I can set and I can learn and so can you. So the way for correction to come is for each individual to take, as I said a couple weeks ago on auditorium, to take the road less traveled, which is the way, the truth, and the life. Isaiah speaks to that. 
we've been going down the road that most people go down, which is studying under denomination and religion and traditions of men. We listen to pastors that say the same thing over and over and over, expecting different results, and it doesn't happen. Uh, Vicki Russ called me the other day and just said, thank you. And I said, what do you mean, thank you? And I started to say, well, it's about time you said that. <laughs> I always kid her like that. But she had gone to a funeral, and there was a very nice old gentleman, just as sweet as he could be, talked quiet and compassionately, but the words came out of his mouth were poison. It was all about everybody's a sinner, everybody's always a sinner, nobody's righteous, nobody will ever be righteous till after they die. If you don't ask Jesus to forgive you every time you do something wrong, you're going to go to hell. That's what he just kept preaching. But see, that's what he was taught. We don't have to feed off that kind of stuff. And just because the crowds are listening to it doesn't mean it's right. The crowds always listen to the lie because they don't know there's more. So Isaiah 53 speaks to this way, the truth, and the life. And verse 8, uh, uh, excuse me, 35 and verse 8, and the highway shall be there. Now who's the highway? That's Jesus, right? He's the way. He made the highway. Where did man live? They lived in the low way, right? They, were, they, they had no way of getting off that low way until Jesus' resurrection or Christ, the new man resurrection, then he brought us to the highway. So it says, and a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. Now what that means is they're going, to be, they're going to be influenced by it also. They're not going to pass over it. They're going to go down that highway. That makes sense? Yeah. The people that don't know, the people that don't understand. But it shall be for those. It's for everybody. The wayfaring man, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go upon thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And how many are redeemed? All. Everybody's redeemed. All people are. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. In other words, in their understanding. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I have personally experienced that. Any of you? My sorrow and my sighing and my, you know, wishing to fly away, wishing to die, always trying to do what I thought the afflicting soul was, had been had done away with, and now I literally have everlasting joy. I'm a happy man today, much happier than I was 10, 15 years ago. So the greatest way to explain what I'm teaching out of this section of Scripture is I'm picturing how our brain, our intellect, the conscious awareness is learning to lean to the mind of Christ. And we truly are learning how to pray, or like I'm teaching on Sunday morning, we're learning how to commune with God. Praying is nothing but communing with God, perfectly with Father God. Uh, I say this all the time, if you want to know somebody, the best thing to do is commune with them, right? You know, Don and I, when Wanda started coming to Tree of Life Christian Fellowship, we wanted to get to know her more. So. You know, a few times we invited her to go out to eat. She invited us to her home. You know, we tried to get away where the crowds weren't there, where other people around where we could sit and listen, and we learned more and more about her. And the more we listened to her, the more we uh, fellowship on her life, then we become one. We understand and we know, and that's what Father wants for us. Romans 8, 23 talks about the redemption of our body. Many people think that's a future event. They think that's coming some other day, but. What does redeem mean to you? That's what you need to understand yourself. What does it mean? Well, to me, it means something has been taken away hostage and has been taken back. What Adam did to the first man, he, his, his choice to live separate from God, took him into hostage. The Bible says that they were cast down to the pit. It said Adam could do, bring him no help. They lived as void of God's life, and so they lived in the lower realm. But Jesus came and delivered us from that, mankind, destroyed that, or humanity, and brought them up. So the redemption of our body means our body is being brought to the state it was when Father created man. Now it's already there. It's already there, but we don't see it yet, right? We don't see it. I'm going to talk about that in services out there today about this immortality must put on, I mean, this mortality must put on immortality. And so it's something that we do because it's already true. We do that by understanding. We do that by grasping the truth. We do that by believing the truth. So the more our brain, our conscious awareness is renewed to what is true of us, the more the Christ life is expressed through our body. And that's what will literally swallow up all aspects of mortality. Mortality to me is anything in my mind that lives with perception that I have to die. That's mortality. If I believe I have to die, then that hinders the very life of God from flowing through me. 
if I believe I have to get old, I have to get wrinkles, I have to get arthritis, if I believe that's just normal, then that's what my life is going to be because it hinders the life of God. But if I believe that the very life of God is greater than anything that can present itself against me, and I believe that none of that is a power, and I continue to feed on truth, it's releasing that life. And I believe it is in our life right now that mo most of you can say that you're experiencing life in a greater way than you did 10, 15 years ago. What did you? So, as Dr. K. Fairchild wrote in her notes on the proverb, it says she considers a field or the world, oh, let me back up again, I want to read it in King James. She considers a field and buys it. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. So, Dr. K. K. translated, it says she considers a field of the world by understanding Jesus reconciled all men. And she gets people planted in that understanding. So that's talking about us, family. When we realize that we have a virtuous mind and our mind is full of the truth, then we will plant people in that understanding. And since we go out and we purchase that field and we plant it, that field needs to be planted with the truth. It already has the life of God in it. The, the field is the people. All people already have the life of God. All people, it's been, it's been if you would, it's been pushed forward. But literally, we plant it in the truth of understanding. So now you can see this is the result of a person putting on the mind of Christ. Or well, you say, well, wait a minute, I thought I had the mind of Christ. You do. But see, there needs to be a putting on. And it's not just like I have a suit, so this morning I went and put it on here. It means put it on in understanding. When Paul said put on, take off, he was saying take off that old way of understanding and put on the new way of understanding. So we must wake up every day. Is it getting warm to you guys in here? Won't you, would you mind turning it down a little, Donna, so it'll go off? Drop it down two or three degrees below what it actually says the temperature is. So we, we want to see the result of this. Uh, it's, it's walking in this conscious awareness of Father God. Everywhere you go, you're always aware of God's life. Everywhere you go, you're in tune with that. I mean, look at your body. Do you, you think your heart worries about getting blood to it? it? It just does what it's supposed to do. Its job is just to pump it, and it just flows. And the body renews that blood. The, the lungs uh, take the carb, uh, carbon monoxide out of it and puts oxygen in it. The heart doesn't sit there and worry about it. That. It just sits there and pumps and pumps and pumps, and it's always aware that there's life coming to it. Every part of our body should be that way. And so our mind needs to have an understanding that every day of our life, the life of God is our source. The life of God is our motivator. It's in us. We don't have to be out praying, God, would you do this? God, would you do that? We just live a life of expectancy. And I'm telling you, in my life, uh, in Donna's life, in many areas of her life, the Lord has really showed that where we do not worry about many things anymore. Do things present itself? Oh, yeah. This weekend we had something present itself to us that, in a, as a uh, carly-minded person, we could have just really cratered. We could have just begun to worry and fret, not be able to sleep, get acid indigestion, and all the stuff that comes from that. But you know what we said? We know what we know. We believe what we preach. And we're not going to worry. It's no thing. And the person that presented the problem to us, we reminded them, if you'll just look back and count your blessings and name them, you realize that you will come through this. You will not go down. You will not go under. But it's an attitude. It's, it's, it's in a position of an attitude and if you don't know that you know, then you can go under. And it's not because it's it's legal, it's not because it has to, but because it's you don't know where to put your faith. We're learning where to put our faith. So, uh, we see the results by putting on the mind of this awareness, and that's when the materialization takes place. Uh, I remember when uh, John started coming here and other people, and right off the bat, what do we want, John? We want uh, manifestation. When is this manifestation going to take place? When is it going to happen? Well, it just gradually takes place. It's just not something you really will even recognize that it took place. And you'll get to the point where you'll look back and say, wow, that was different than how I normally react to that. Or, or wow, this didn't happen or this didn't happen. You begin to realize that you already are the manifestation. You're the very manifestation of Christ. But then you come to that conscious awareness of that. And as you live out of that, then it just becomes part of your life and it becomes the norm. It's just like somebody comes and they give us a testimony and say, you know, Donna Misi had a problem last week and we laid hands on her and this happened and they're just so amazed and oh my gosh, it's like it's a miracle and I want to say, no, that's just the way life should be. It shouldn't shock us anymore. I'm not saying we don't want to tell people about 
while we're walking it, but it just should be the norm. It should be norm that all of you have all the funds that you need to sustain you every day. It should be the norm that your body is healthy and whole. It should be normal that when they start hollering, the flu's coming and everybody needs to get a shot and this is going on, that you just go through this and you didn't get sick. You, you didn't receive any of that because you know who you are. The flu has no place in my body. I know that. And I don't, I don't walk around saying, I'm not getting it, I'm not getting it. But in my mind, I'm saying, I'm not getting it. I'm not receiving it because you know what? It's like that mosquito that bit me once. You flew away singing, there's power in the blood. Yes. <laughs> so, and I don't get bit by mosquitoes anymore for some reason. I used to say it's because I take vitamin E, but I, I bet it's been five, six, seven years since a mosquito has even bit me. And uh, I, I'm not saying it's because I'm anything special, but I'm just saying I don't believe that they can bite me anymore. I don't believe anything can infect my body with anything because I know that the very life of God repels that. And so there's just little things that the Lord shows me. I'm not saying a mosquito is never going to bite you. And I'm not saying it's because of anything. But I just believe we're going to see where nothing can, can, nigh, our, can come nigh our dwelling place. Yes. If cancer doesn't belong to us, and the flu doesn't belong to us, and a cold doesn't belong to us, and an infection doesn't belong to us, you know, there's nothing big, there's nothing little with, little with God. Anything that's anti-Christ does not belong to you. Amen. Amen. And so we must receive that and believe that. So we can have the mind of Christ, yet never awaken to that fact and experience that Jesus' work of redemption provided that for man. That's why I say, and some people have different interpretations of that. My friend Brian in New York, she ha he has an understanding that's really good. But my understanding is that the people who are dead in Christ, they're just not awake to these things. They don't know these things. They don't understand the word dead in Christ has nothing to do with the physical death of a body. It means no knowledge. It's just like there are people in the United States of America that are dead in America. They're living a poor life. They live on the streets. They, they, they work for really small wages all their life and they have no clue that they can get more. I mean, that's the truth. I asked some of my uh, counselors recently if you could get a really good hourly wages and, and they have the ability to make much more than they're making. They have the ability to make several hundred dollars an hour if they want to. But their mindset was if I could get twenty dollars an hour that would be great. And you know for people that work by the hour that would be great. But when you think about that, that's just eight hundred dollars a week. Now some people that would be good. But when you have somebody that's a salesperson that has the ability to make eight hundred in one night because all they have to do is go out and make two prearranged funeral sales at people under sixty years old they can make over. They can make twelve hundred dollars in one night, but yet they're sitting there wishing they could get a job for twenty dollars an hour. They don't know who they are. They don't know the talent that they have, and they don't know what's been offered to them. One of my jobs in my company as a director of seminar process is to go to people and wake them up to what you have. You have an opportunity to make much more money, but what you are is you're stuck in your quota. The company gives you a quota of thirty-five thousand a month. And when you hit that, you're happy, but $35,000 a month is not that much money. And so I try to wake people up. So the same thing with us. We go to people and say, guess what? There is a life greater than when you live. And you know what the struggle is with that family? As I have people, even in our congregation, the past have told me, I live a very good life. I'm happy with my life. You know, I've got two cars. I've got children. I have a nice home. You know, I've got money in the bank. But you know what? That's not life and life more abundantly. You'll end up going to the grave with that, right? Yes. If that's your life, you'll end up maybe someday with disease or whatever because that is not going to sustain you because that can go away overnight. It's temporal, is it not? I mean, how many of you have had things and then lost them? Yes. All of us have. So it's temporal. So that's not life and life abundantly, and that's what we want to explain to people. There's more to it than that. There's more to life and life abundantly that, God, that Jesus has brought us. So the true experience comes as we awaken to the way, the truth, and the life way of life, and we walk in the cool of the day with a plural, as the plural Father God. Now remember in the book of Genesis, uh, verse 3, uh, chapter 8, it said that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Uh, as a young person, I just thought that meant they went out about 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening, the sun was going down, and they just walked with it through the trees, and it was pretty out there, and... You know, that's what most people think, but that's not what it is. It's the Ruach. It's the very spirit. In other words, Adam walked in a body on planet Earth, but he was also in the spirit realm. There was no difference. 
He was spirit. He glowed with the very light of God. I do not believe he had skin on him at that time. I believe man was a spirit. They glowed with the very life of God, but they could be seen. They saw each other. They could affect the planet. Yes. They, they, the planet didn't affect them. They could affect, uh, affect. They rule and reign because God told them to do that over everything, and they were to reproduce in that image, but they didn't. Something happened. They chose to separate themselves from the knowledge of God, and they had skin put on them, and from that point on they reproduced as humans. And so it's ruach, and the word ruach is wind by resemblance of breath, uh, and it's an exaltation, if you would. It's the spirit of God. They literally were spirit. So let's identify first what the field is, because it says she considers a field. What that is, family, that is a way of thinking. That's a way of thinking. A parable that Jesus gave, as recorded in Matthew chapter 15, breaks this down because uh, this is a mindset. She begins to have a mindset that she's more concerned about herself. She's less concerned about herself and becoming more concerned about the field. That's when I say out there in the auditorium, we need to become priests. You don't have to, but if you don't, you'll never be happy. And what I mean by a priest is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Yeah. A priest that goes out to the world and your whole purpose is to offer bread and wine everywhere you go. When I fly in a plane, my desire is to be able to minister to people. My desire when I'm sitting out there in the airport is to minister to people, be sensitive to the Lord. Many times the Lord speaks to me and I'll look at somebody and I'll hear, they're going to sit by you, be ready. I hear that all the time now. My, my desire is to go on my job and help other people excel. They may not even know that I'm ministering most holy place things to them. But when I get up and teach in front of people, I use biblical principles to teach them. And, I, and they agree with that. So this woman that has, has, has had her mind, or her, excuse me, her brain or her intellect renewed, she's no longer focusing on herself. And you can see where people at, are at. And we don't judge people out there. And, and I don't want people to ever think that when they give us a prayer request that we're judging. You say, oh, you're just a baby. We don't do that. But we respect people where they're at. But you can see where people are in their maturity level when it's always about them, right? Pray for this, pray for this, and it's always about them. But when they come to the place, instead of being the one to get prayed for, they're down there to minister to other people, right? When they come to church to be a blessing instead of to, to be blessed. Now, most of my life, I came to be blessed. I was always needing an answer. I was, you know, when I went down to pray, it was always about bless me, touch me. It was all about me having an experience, if you would. But that's when you get to the most holy place around and your, and your brain and intellect have been given truth. Then you're there to bless people and you're there to minister to people and you're there to help people. And we'll see later on in the virtuous woman experience that God exalts that person. God exalts that person. God brings that person to a place where that person can minister. In my career, it's happened in my career. I've always been a person that wants to help other people excel and to bless people and help people. Because of that, that's why I'm where I'm at today. But if you're always about yourself, you're pretty much just going to stay in that position. Wouldn't you agree with me? Yes. Yeah. You know, because you're... Your company recognizes this is a person that we can use to help our business become better because this person wants to help other people and they can equip that person. So our job is to do that. So we'll break this mindset down and this needs to be developed. In Matthew 13, 24, Jesus is giving parables. Jesus always talked in parables, did he not? Yes. One of the parables people argue with me about the most is the rich man, poor man. When I try to explain that there's no such thing as the place called hell, that the then Catholic Church translated the Valley of Gehenna into been hell. It was a garbage dump. We know all that. But they'll argue, and they say, well, now, wait a minute. Uh, what about the rich man, poor man? And I try to tell them it's a parable, and they say, no, it's not. It's real. No, it's a parable. Jesus always spoke in parables. He always showed pictures. And, it's, uh, and the Holy Spirit's here to explain that. And most of the time, he explained it right after he said it. Did he not? Almost every time. So it says here, another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven. Now what's the kingdom of heaven? Is it a planet out there somewhere? Righteousness it's righteousness, peace, peace and joy. joy. The you kingdom of God, it. the kingdom of heaven. Every saying like that is righteousness, peace and joy. It's literally what's inside of us. Right. So the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy. Now the Greek word for that is hateful people. Most people would think that means a devil. But it just, when you look it up, it says hateful people. That's religious people. That's Pharisees and Sadducees. 
So his enemy, hateful religious people, came and sowed afterwards tares among the wheat. You know, family, I've had that happen. Many times I've got up and I've preached truth, and then somebody comes alongside and gives the tares. They begin to say, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but, you know, this or that. Oh, you know, we used to have, years ago, in our, in our fellowship, Tree of Life Fellowship, we used to have a couple that always did what I called parking lot prophecies. I would preach the truth, and then they would gather people around them out in the parking lot and say, oh, Brother Roy doesn't know, let me explain this to you. Or the wife would be taking two or three back into another room, teaching them why I'm preaching. They were sowing tares, and that's not good. That goes on today. But it says, so afterwards, uh, tares among the wheat and went his way. That's The wheat is Jesus' work of redemption, is it not? And so have not people sown tares in his redemptive work? One of the biggest ones is that he just died for you. That's a big tear, that he just died for you. Another one is over and over and over they translated scripture to be shall. We shall be. We will be. It's always putting things off in the future. That's a big tear. We can go through many of them. So, verse 26, but when the grain had sprouted up and produced crop, the tares also <coughs> appeared. Now, if we continue to go through that parable, it would talk about taking the pears and binding them up and burning them. Well, what that's talking about is take the tares and expose it to the Word of God and it reveals the truth. That's not sending people to hell like we, I was taught. Yes. It's Anytime it says burn with fire, the word fire always pictures the Word of God. So what we've done is all of us have had tares sowed in us, right? Every one of us have had tares sowed in us. We've had the lie taught. And so what by grace we've been brought to a place where ministry can burn you with fire, burn you with the Word of God, and it's gradually removing the tares away. Right? It's Neva, isn't that true with you? I mean, when you first come, you Adam still, I'm sure you still do, because we all still have some tears up there. But has not the word revealed some of that to you? And it's burned it away, and so now you're no longer under that bondage. And it's just a simple truth. So this is the parable of the wheat and the tares. The parable is in the world, in the world, which is people, the good sower, the Lord Jesus Christ, has sowed good seed. Now we need to see what the word sowed good seed means because. Prior to me meeting Brother Garner, even after I met Brother Garner for a while, I still believed that everybody, until they, quote, got saved, that their spirit was dead. I remember arguing with Larry Hutchison, my good friend, one day. He was trying to tell me that everybody had God's spirit still in them. And, you know, my mind said, not until you get saved, not until you say that sinner's prayer. You know, and I thought everybody after Adam died spiritually was completely, but they did not. We really know now that their spirit just went into a non-existent state. It was in them, but they never drew from it. They separated themselves from spirit, right? So if I taught this that he so seed like he put the life of God in them, then that would be wrong, right? And so I looked this up last night, and again, if you read what the King James says, then you would think that man did not have the life of God in them. But the phrase which sowed is, is spiro, and it means he strengthened it. He strengthened it. Now, think about this. I have muscles in me, don't I? But to look at me, you wouldn't think I would. My legs are very muscular because it's got 200-something pounds. It's carrying around all the time. But my arms, my muscles are not real strong. My, of course, my stomach muscles, my back muscles aren't real strong because I don't do a lot of muscles. I exercise. But that doesn't mean there's no muscle there. Correct? Right. But it's not helping me. It's not helping me stand up straight. If you don't have good back muscles, then you can't stand up straight. Most people try to exercise, but you need to walk and exercise your back muscles. If I met, my back muscles begin to uh, be strengthened, then I can stand up straight. If my arm muscles can be strengthened, I can begin to lift loads that I nor can't normally lift. And if my hands can be strengthened, I can open jars. And sometimes I even have to say, Donna, would you help me open the jar? You know, because I've had surgeries in my hand. And, but see, I need to be exercised. I need to be exercised. And see, the Word of God exercises you or it denudes you. The word exercise actually means to exercise nude. In other words, be denuded of all the religious lies that's been put in your brain. That's what it says here. So literally... When he sowed good seed, he strengthened man. He began to quicken their spirit. He began to bring that spirit back to life, uh, to an active life. Then the root, the root Greek word is uh, for, for uh, spiro is, is spao, 
And speo means to draw out or forth. So that's what God did. When Jesus, uh, when Christ the new man was resurrected, on the day of Pentecost, when God didn't send a spirit back in man like we were taught, He said the spirit of truth would come to you. He said the comforter would come to you. And that was, that's when God was able to begin to talk to men again. But literally, God, Jesus Christ, drew forth that very spirit of God in man and made it active again. And any man can draw from the spirit today. But religion and tradition crept in and began to change the truth of the word. They began to say, you know, Paul, it's all right for you to teach this Christianity thing, but why don't you let them still be circumcised? Just, just you know, let them practice some of the Jewish laws and some of our Hebrew laws. And, of course, Paul didn't, but they wanted to leaven the whole lump. But then some people began to do things and it leavened the whole lump and it pushed it back down. And I like the word good. It said, so good seed. It's kalos, and I was really excited to see this last night. It means beautiful but chiefly good as a noun. It's not that you're good, Ralph, because you do good things. People think, well, this guy gave me money, this guy did this, this guy did this, and they say they're really good. That's not a measure of good. Because, quote, bad people do good things. All right? And I don't want to talk about good or evil, but I'm just trying to show you Anytime you see good, it's a noun. A noun is a person or place or a thing. You are good because God is good. Jesus said there's none good but the Father. That was before His resurrection. Amen. Right? That was before His resurrection. Now we are the plural of God, so we're good as a noun, not good at what we do. But if you're good as a noun, then you're going to do good things. What is that? You're going to bless people. Can't help it. And then it says virtuous, and here we are studying the virtuous woman, and that's what it says. So right there is proof positive that in Jesus' resurrection and his thus sending the very Spirit of God to push forward, to strengthen, and to draw forth, he made all people virtuous right then. Yes. yes. And it's really sad, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John really did not know that. They did not. They still were concerned about sitting at Jesus' right hand. They were still concerned about uh, him casting out, the, uh, destroying the Roman uh, Empire. That's what they thought he was there to do. They wanted him to come like a knight in shining armor and deliver them from all their enemies. And Jesus kept telling them, and he kept telling them, and he said, guys, you, you, you let it slip. He said, you can't bear it. And he, what he was saying is, it keeps slipping from your hands. You can't grasp what I'm going to do. But be a good chair. I'm going to send the comforter. I'm going to send the paraclete. I'm going to send the teacher. And he's going to teach you and he's going to lead you and he's going to guide you in all these things. Yes. And But he had to do it with the Apostle John and the Apostle Paul. That's how he did it. He, he explained things to them. They saw the truth and they wrote it down. The Apostle Paul wrote it very clear. But the, but the translators of Scripture brought much confusion. Yes. The Apostle John wrote it uh, very clear and you say, well, the book of Revelation is not very clear. Yes, it's real clear if you know the Old Testament. You can translate those scriptures. Some of them, they added wrong words to it. But you can understand when it says that I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You can understand when he said, I heard a voice behind me and I turned to see. If you know the tabernacle of Moses. But if you don't, you have no clue. Right? You have no clue that the, the, what the, the, uh, the uh, one like the Son of Man in the midst of the golden candlestick, you don't know that that was in the holy place. You don't know that he was feeding on the table of showbread. You don't understand that feeding on the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ causes you to begin to see with your eyes to see and begin to hear with your ears to hear. So the people were not taught that. For since Jesus' resurrection, for over 2,000 years, I would say 99% of all people have never been taught these truths. There are a lot of people that knew them. There were people in the 1800s, 1700s. Probably every generation there's been somebody on this earth that had some understanding but did not have a clear understanding because they rejected and pushed back. In what Kay Fairchild wrote about this virtuous woman, and later on in some of the verses she wrote in there, she said this virtuous woman is not worried about what people think. This virtuous woman doesn't care about a reputation. This virtuous woman cares about people. This virtue woman is going to teach the truth, so help me God. Amen?
So then the word seed, I was telling Butch last night, every time I say sperm in church, you should see some of the people's faces. Yeah. You would think we were talking to children. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, old, older people aren't used to saying sperm and sex and all that stuff. It drives them, you know, you're not supposed to talk about that kind of stuff. But literally, the word of God is the sperma, S-P-E-R-M-A. But this sperm here, when it talked about the seed, this sperm is kept over for planting. Now, I thought that was interesting when I read that in the Greek, kept over for planting. And I thought, well, Lord, what is that? And, and I began to hear that this sperm is the new covenant. This sperm is a covenant that's going to be forever and for forever and forever. Th this sperm, this life that he put in us and quickened us with will never be degenerate. It will never go away. It's always going to be here for age after age after age. So what's God waiting for? He's waiting for us to believe. He's waiting for us to wake up to the truth. If we don't, it can go to another generation and another generation. I don't want to be one that somebody reads 150 years from now. Well, look, they knew it back then. Tree of Life Ministries, Destiny Life Center, they knew it back then. Why didn't people believe? Wow. But see, I can go to Charles Price's uh, from the 1850s, 1870s to 1925. He wrote a tremendous amount of the Pauline Revelation. But he still mixed it a little bit. But why didn't people believe that? Same reason they don't believe it today. Is they're lazy? They don't care? They don't want to study to show themselves approved. They're happy with the life they have. All they're worried about is going fishing, hunting, making a living, you know, just carving out the best life they can. And they don't know that there's more. And even if they do know there's more, they're not willing to go all the way. I want to go all the way. You know, why is it that my muscles aren't strong? I know I can join a gym. In fact, I joined a gym, and I had this good intentions, and I paid for a whole year, and I probably went three or four times. But I know if I go lift weights, I know if I walk, I know if I ride my bike, I know if I swim, my body can get in shape. But why don't I do it? Well, because I'm in my mind, I'm too busy. In my mind, it hurts. You know, any of you watch The Biggest Loser? I, I sit there and make fun of them, and I thought, you're just as bad. I'm not making fun of them because they're big, but I make fun of them because they whine and they cry. But guess what? I would do the same thing. <laughs> I'd say, I can't do it no more. But see, that's a lie. We can. Yes, we can. I, I can ever, I've got weights in my, in my closet. I could sit there every morning, and I've done it a few times, but then I just quit. Before I put my shoes on, I can bend down, pick up those weights, and I can lift them about 15 times. If I would do that every day, what would that do for me? Build the muscle. It would build my muscle. Just, just, <laughs> if I would just do it... 15 times every day and gradually lift those up. I can do setups. They say 30 minutes a day is all that you really need. Yeah, but I don't have 30 minutes. 30? Yeah, I do. But it's the same thing spiritually, family. So, his, he, this is what he did. This is what Jesus did in his resurrection. He strengthened and drew forth his life being planted forever and ever and ever. This spermia that was put in man at, in the resurrection was a drawing forth and a quickening of the very life of God that had been pushed down and it's there forever and it's planted and it will never digress. However, there has been other seed planted in this field, meaning the conscious part of man. That's what's hindering the life of God is that other seed. And Don Amici, that's why we must be the kind of people that say, Father, here's my brain. Yes. I'm not going to fight for the right to be this way anymore. My friend Kevin uh, Maine posted something on Facebook about homosexuals and lesbians and he was just talking about how you know people don't understand that they were born this way and 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 he didn't say created but he said born this way and I uh, and that they've been rejected and the church should not reject them and I called him and I talked to him I said Kevin we do not reject them no more than we reject a liar or a gossiper I mean there's people in this church that are not living the life that they should we don't reject them we say, come and dine. But we're not going to sit here and say, you're okay, I'm okay. We're not going to say that God created you to be a liar, or a child abuser, or, or a homosexual, or a lesbian, or a thief, or, or even just a good person. He created us to be Christ. And what we must do is come together and admit, I show the house the house, admit that I'm not living the way God created me to live. But yet there are people because... They've been so beat up and, and they don't seem to be able to get any help that they just say, well, this is the way God made me to live and you have to accept me the way I am. Well, I will accept you, but I won't accept you the way you are. If you're an alcoholic, I'll accept you, but I'm not going to accept you the way you are because I know what 
alcoholism does to you. It will eat up your liver. It will destroy you. I want you to live free from that. And whatever it is, we're not going to deal with it. We're not going to say, okay, you need to go to alcoholism class. You need to go to homosexual deliverance class or a liar deliverance class. We're going to say, you need to come and feed on the bread and wine. And But you've got to admit that everything you're doing is not necessary Christ. And then you can let God show you the comings in thereof that drives out everything that's not of Him. Yeah. But what we've done, Ralph, is we've decided what's of Him. Right. Well, it's of Him for me to be this way. He created, and but see, people say that because that's the only way they can continue in that and keep a sane mind. I believe that. So those of you that are listening, you know, if you're a homosexual lesbian, I'm not against you. If you're a liar, a cheater, a gossiper, a, a, a drug addiction, I'm not against you. You're the child of God. You're just you got just as much Christ in me as I do. If you die, you will be with the Lord. But if we don't all allow the life of God to change us to His image, then we will die. We will perish. We will have disease. We will suffer. And that is not God's will. God does not want that to happen. There's a lady at Kay Fairchild's church that's that has cancer in her body. She's the one that uploads her sermons and they just recently told her that it's in her brain now. They told her she has six months to live. And she, asked, she didn't ask that. They thought she asked that. They told her that. But I'm telling you, that does not belong to that lady. And I told Kay, we are all going to be speaking life to her. Uh, I, I shouldn't know her name, but I can't recall it. But we're going to speak life to her. And Kay said, if her body lets go, I'm going to jump on her and tell her to rise up. Yes. But we should do that. We should, we should do that. So it's a life that's available to us. So there has been this seed, and Jesus identifies the field in verse 38. He says, the, for, the, the field is the world, meaning man. So notice, the virtuous woman considers a field and she buys it. If you tell me that you know all this stuff already, you know everything that I'm teaching you, and everything Brother Garner taught, and everything that Butch is teaching, and you don't need us to teach you anymore, then I'm going to say, why aren't you out there helping the field? Why aren't you out there buying it? Buying it means you're, you're, you're giving it the truth. Why aren't you been a blessing to people? That's like telling me, oh, I already went to college, I've got my medical degree, I took four years of, of surgery, and you're just out playing around doing nothing. Well, why aren't you out operating on people? Why did you do that? Why did you do? If you really know that, you're going to be helping people. What's the purpose of knowing it if you don't? Yeah, what's the purpose? And I've had people tell me, oh, I know it all already. At Tree of Life, we had people come to our church and they just got kind of bored. They begin to loathe the light bread. They begin to see it as unsubstantial. They begin to think that they knew it all and they just left. And they quit going to church. They quit doing a lot of stuff. And you know what? I, I don't understand that. I'm not going to say that they're no good to anybody, but I'm just saying I don't understand how you can think that you know it all because it is the inexhaustible riches of our Lord Jesus Christ. It, it's the, I call it the never-ending story. Yes. It is a never-ending story. All my sermons are never-ending. I tell you, every year I can go back and rewrite everything I've done, and we're doing it as fast as we can, but it's just like it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Last night, I was writing this, and I was writing the lesson for this morning, and uh, as I was writing this, I would back up about a page and a half, and I'd call Butch and share a, 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 what a translation. I would call Kay to share a translation. When I hung up in my mind, I thought, well, this is where I was at, so I began to go through it and just kept adding more and more and more. I'm telling you, I can take four pages and turn it into a book, Canada. I can take four pages and preach two or three hours because it's just so big, and the lamb trail goes everywhere. Yes. It goes everywhere. It's just hard to stop. You know, I have people tell me, get on with it, get on with it. Well, sometimes it's just hard to stop. You're, you're, the Spirit of God is enlarging it inside of you. So what we see is that we must have a mind to help people. God gave that to me many years ago before I knew anything. I've always wanted to help people. I love people. I want to rescue them from their sorrows. And, 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 but I didn't know how because I was still kind of bound up myself. But we, we must have a mind to help people. We possess an understanding that Jesus redeemed and reconciled all people. What a great understanding. Ralph, it's awesome to be able to go to people and say, you know what? God loves you already. You don't have to crawl and beg Him to forgive you. You don't have to walk an aisle and say a sinner's prayer. You don't have to do what the church says you have to do. Just come and let me help you understand. Come and dine. Come and feed on what He's done. 
out of that understanding, she, that brain teaches and brings an awareness of them planted in him or with his life. If the field is the world, then this woman who does what is necessary to pay the price, she brings the world the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what's necessary. If you're studying just for you, it's all just going to go away. If, you're, if you don't give it out, it doesn't keep flowing. Amen. It really doesn't. So she sees the world and it says she buys it. She sees the world and pays the price to bring it to that understanding. And see what we've done. Uh, I can say Brother Garner paid a great price to bring understanding to people. I think he overdid it some. He never rested. He never slept. It was so driving and burning inside of him, he was barely able to sleep two hours. And he paid a price for that because it, it affected his body. But he did pay a price so he could bring us this tremendous truth of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And I appreciate that. I have paid a price. My family has paid a price. You will pay a price if you're going to go all the way. The price is to study to show yourself approved. Can't get yeah. If you don't study to show yourself approved, then how in the world are you going to tell somebody else that they're oh, approved? If you don't feel approved, then, and John, that's the problem. You used to say, well, why aren't all these other preachers preaching this? Because they don't feel approved. They still feel like sinners. We said under a ministry for many years that the man, I don't believe he ever understood real forgiveness. I don't think he understand, understood real redemption. And because of that, I mean, I would see him crying and pleading with God to change him. I used to do that because I didn't know I've already been changed. I've already been made whole. The word reconcile actually means change and made different. We've already been changed. We've already been made different. I don't need to change. Uh, Judy wrote that song, God's Not Changing Me. And in the beginning, Brother Garner had a little struggle with that because he thought we were being changed. And I said, you're not listening to it, Brother Garner. It says, God's not changing me. He's waking me up to who I already am. There's the difference. Most people think it's something that he has to do to us. And our prayer life has always been, God changed me, God changed me. Amen. Change my desires, change my wants. Changed what I think, and literally I need to say, Father, I thank you that you've already changed me, and I thank you that you're waking me up to that. Yeah. I am not who I think I am. I'm not what I want to do. I don't get my peace from drinking alcohol. I don't get my peace from smoking cigarettes. I don't get my peace from drugs. I don't get my peace from vanilla ice cream. My peace comes within. And so I thank God that He showed me that, that wherever I seem to be lacking, I could just by faith draw from within. You know? And how many times are you presented with an opportunity to fear and worry? Donna, you've been through that with your employment, right? And, and what, you, what we have to do, and I'm so glad you've been back here because I think it's helped you, is you just have to say, what does that have to do with me? Just like Brother Garner said uh, years ago when I was talking to him about the price of gas, he said, what does that have to do with you, Roy? Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't quite understand him. I just thought, what's wrong? Are you mad at me or something? But uh, now I know, and I'm glad he said that to me. What does that have to do with me? Nothing. My employer is not my source. Right. See, I've been presented with some possible changes in me, and, and I could get upset, but you know what? I refuse to get upset. I refuse to react, because if I react, it can bring what I fear upon me. Correct? Right. So she's not afraid of what some might think about her, say about her, or do to her. I promise you, you better get there if you're going to teach the truth. Don't worry about it. Don't react to it. Don't get upset. Does it hurt? Yes. Yeah. I'm not going to sit and tell you I haven't been hurt. I've been hurt in the house of my friends many, many times. Still get that way, but I'm not, I'm not backing down. I'm going to go all the way. She's not worried about losing the respect of man whose breath is in his or her nostrils. In other words, those who just get their understanding from the sense realm. Can I say it this way? Those who just trust what the King James Version says. Because that all came from a sense realm. It came from a sense of separation from God. These people, highly likely, the ones that translated it, the reason they did it is because they couldn't see themselves that way. They couldn't see themselves as righteous, so they put in there, shall be, will be. I mean, can you see that? Yes. But I do believe the ones that were in control of it did it for a particular reason. Yes, they did. Okay. So she has the calling. And see, again, if those people would have studied to show their self-approved, they wouldn't have done that. And guess what? The apostle... I, the apostle, excuse me, Martin Luther was studying the book of Romans to translate. He didn't just do what they told him. He studied it. What did he see? The just shall live by faith. And that's why we have a tremendous reformation that took place back then. So he did what the apostle Paul told Timothy to do. Timothy, you won't be ashamed. 
you won't fall prey to all this religious stuff out there, you know, because don't you think Timothy has been tried to be persuaded by the Jewish people to go back? And he said, Timothy, you won't be ashamed if you'll study. Study the Word. Study the Torah. Study the written Word. Study what I'm writing. And the Holy Spirit will show you that you are already approved. Yes. And guess what? I bet you Timothy could go out and tell people you're approved yes. too. Yes. God loves you unconditional. So she has this calling of Jeremiah. We all have this calling of Jeremiah. She is set over the brains and intellect of men, which is nations, to root out pull down to destroy and throw down all the religious lies and wrong thinking so that she can build plant in the consciousness of man the way the truth and the life understanding that's what we're to do we are holy spirit we have is we're one with holy spirit we're one with father and he uses us to teach and lead and guide and bring people to the truth of the way the truth and the life way of living there is a better way and that's why i'm teaching out in the auditorium i'm teaching people if they'll listen and they'll receive it, a better way of life. Yeah. And I'm so excited they're beginning to receive it. Uh, you would be surprised what we're seeing out there. We're not getting that pushback. Uh, people are understanding, and people are beginning to give us testimonies how it's changing their life. That's our reward. Amen. That's my reward. It talks about she receives a reward. My reward is seeing you live out of what we're teaching you. In Matthew 13, 44, we find, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. Now, the word treasure, it's that's it's, T-H-E-S-A-U-R-U-S, -E -S, and it means a deposit hidden in a field. So what did God do, family? What did Jesus do? Or God, however you want to call it, looked into the field, which was the world. It was the cosmos system. It was people living as human. And what did he see? He saw inside of them his life. But it wasn't active. They wasn't drawing out of it. So he saw this treasure. And how did he buy the field? He became the field. Right? Correct? Yeah. He became the field. So the field is the people in this cosmos system. And it says, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now what does the Bible say about Jesus going to the cross? It says, for joy. Mm -hmm. For joy mm -hmm. he endured that. He, why did, I mean, how could somebody go to that cross and in the physical yeah. have any joy in the fact that they're going to put nails through your hands and nails through your feet and they're going to pierce your side and they're going to put a crown of thorns on your head and you're going to sit there. And if you've ever read about what it's like to be crucified, it's horrible. Yeah. If, if you let down, you suffocate. If you lift up, you're in excruciating pain. So it's up and down and trying to live. And just the physical part, not alone. The spiritual part right. where he became human. And it says for joy. Why? Because he knew yeah. that he was getting the field. Yeah. He knew that he was going to push forth yeah. and bring forth and strengthen and bring forth the very life of God and man again today. And it just breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to think it's been 2,000 years. And for the most part, men are not living out of what Jesus did. Yeah. Men had no clue that they were restored to life. They were restored to righteousness, meaning right with God, to everlasting joy, everlasting peace. They had no clue that we had the right to live free from sickness and disease yes. and poverty yeah. in every realm of life. Yes. Yeah. Why? Because the, the lie came forth. Yes. Religion, tradition. I, don't, I just don't understand it. I, I mean, I sit there and I think about it sometimes. I just do not understand how they could not see. And some people say, well, it wasn't but for this appointed time. No, anybody could have. In that 2,000 year period, people could have believed, but they would not. So notice that Jesus is the man who goes and sells all that he has to buy the field. His work, he took the world in himself. He paid the price to purchase the field. So why? Because he saw again in the world, in man, a great treasure being his God's life which was, had been lying dormant for over 4,000 years. And the reason I say over 4,000 years is because I go by our calendar. From supposedly the beginning of time to Jesus, and of course we know the time was much, much more, you know, millions of years, but from the beginning of the story of Adam to Jesus, we see 4,000 years. It could have been longer, we don't know. But regardless, he saw that. He saw that man was living as void of God. He purchased that world with his blood through a sacrifice so this great deposit would rise up and flow again in men. Now here's the mindset. A virtuous woman, a renewed mind or a renewed brain and a conscious is always conscious of bringing people to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It becomes your passion. 
There's nothing better that I enjoy doing than answering questions for people and teaching people and writing on the internet. And I, and I don't say I don't enjoy them with my wife. I, I'm, I'm just saying, but that there that's the thing that really stirs me up inside. That's the thing that brings me peace because I'm called to do that. But guess what? You are too. You're called to do that too in your own way. In your own, you, know, you don't have to know everything I know. You can take what you do know and you can go forth and you can set the captive free from the truth. You know, Donna pays the price for it with mine because it's on the internet and it's, uh, you know, I don't travel and preach as much as I would like to do it. I don't do it that much, but on the internet and by email and by telephone, there's a great, a great withdrawal on me almost every day. Donna can tell you the phone's ringing constantly or I'm responding to somebody and, and, and she may not under, understand it, but it's, without that, I'm dead. Without that, because I have to have a, an output and just Sundays is not enough for me. I love Sunday morning and, and I'm so glad I get to teach back here because when Butch teaches, I'm still teaching every Sunday. Yeah. But it's, it, it's like fire shut up my bones and if I don't give it out, it's going to burn me up on the inside. I really believe that. And I think we're all going to get to that place. You know, a virtuous woman, she, she wants to plant them in understanding. And plant means you stay there. Right? Once you plant them in understanding, they're going to become the lily in the field. The field is the world. The field is the church. But we need some lilies that are shining with the very life of God and the very glory of God. And they're just planted and they just draw. They don't toss. They don't throw. Jesus said that. Consider the lilies field. They, they don't do what you guys do. What we do. They don't sit there, oh God. Please, make sure I have enough money tomorrow. God, give me a raise. God, do this. Something I'm going to say out there in the auditorium today. When, when you look at the wonders of the universe, and I know you admire it, and the clouds, and the, and the birds, and the mountains, and the, and the stars that we see, guess what? Nobody's praying for them. God said, be, and they be. Man is the only one, the only creation of God, that has moved to the place where they fear for their lives. They fear, they worry. Even we, even what we know, we still think about it, do we not? I, I still think about it, but then I just shoo it away. But sometimes I think, I don't have a retirement. I don't have a lot of money. And if I begin to listen to that part of the brain that still thinks about that, I begin to think, what am I going to do when I turn 70? But you know what? <laughs> I'm always saying, I'm just going to keep living. Amen. Every time, I can tell this to you, class, Every time an opportunity presents itself that I could lose, lose uh, money in my employment, that the church can't afford to pay me, or whatever it is, every time a check shows up in the mail from somebody we don't even know. Is it not true, Donna? Every time. And it's just God saying, you don't have to worry about it. If I feed the birds, I feed you. <laughs> That's what I have to remind myself. If He feeds the birds, He feeds me. And it's not even that He's there dropping food down. Do you know where it says Jehovah Jireh, our provider? That word Jireh is, means provider. That was added. Yes. He's just Jehovah. Because if you know him as provider, then you're thinking, okay, you've got to provide for me every day. And you're always out there waiting for your provision to come. He's not Jehovah, your provider. He's Jehovah. He's your God. He is God Almighty. And he is nothing but love as a now. And if he's nothing but love, do you think he's going to let you no. miss out on anything? No. Well, but Pastor Roy, I don't have a lot of money in the bank. Well, that's your problem. You're putting your, your, your uh, life on the basis of how much money you have. Pastor Roy, I don't have this. Pastor Roy, I don't have that. Well, see, that's your problem. You're, you're agreeing with what the eyes see. It matters not how much money you have in the bank. What matters is he's your eternal supply. It's always there. So the, we have this mindset. We get planted in this understanding. Now let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. I want to read three verses and then we'll go. I need to stop now, but I've I got to read these to, right now to you. Huh? I've got, I've got this story on my Facebook. Yeah, we're recording right now. Can you give it to us right after we get done? Yes. Yeah, because it, it'll be a long blank on here if we do. Okay, okay that, but I want to hear it. Now this is my translation here, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, because everyone is in Christ, he, she, they are a new creation. The old worn out way of the anthropos, which means human, or Adam, life has passed away and been made void. Behold, the way, the truth, and the life, way of life has come forth, 
and is perpetually planted in man. In other words, it's always there. All we have to do is draw from it. Verse 21. Having never been separated from Father God, he, being Jesus, entered into the death condition of the entire race of humankind as the federal head of the human race and made that death void and non-existent so that all would be right, one with Father God in a relation to rest ourselves. Now that might be very hard for some people to believe. But nevertheless, the whole of mankind are the righteous of Father God. I posted that on Facebook and one man put, that's cute. It, but even though it's cute, it's not true. Oh, man. I know. I just deleted it. <laughs> you know, I don't have time to argue. That's not cute. That's the truth. Man. That's what Scripture said. So if you agree with those two verses, 17 and 21, then we need to see what's given to us a ministry. People all the time say, I want a ministry. I want a ministry. What's my ministry? What's my ministry? And I used to ask people all the time and always heard, I want to be the preacher. I want to get on the pulpit and talk. I want to, you know, that's not your ministry. That's my ministry right here. And that's Pastor Butch's ministry. But every one of you have a ministry. Not saying you never will, but you all have a ministry. And here's what it is. 2 Corinthians 5.18 Moreover, because of what verse 17 said, Moreover, everyone is the offspring of God. Everyone. Father has made void the old worn out condition of humankind, enterprise, and changed mutually. That's what reconciliation means. Changed mutually us to himself. The channel of Father doing this was Jesus' work of redemption. Therefore, Father has given to us who possess an infinite awareness of the way, the truth, and the life way of life, the ministry, this is your ministry, the ministry and attendance and service of proclaiming, teaching, and explaining this great and mighty atonement and his strengthening and drawing forth of Father's life in every man, woman, boy, and girl. That is your ministry. So you know what you need to be doing? What I said many years ago at Trail Life, you need to be praying that Father will send you to people who are hungry. Yeah, amen. Quit going to everybody and casting your pearl before people that will eat anything. And we need to stop eating anything. You know, we said the heart up. What does the heart up do? She receives seed from anybody. And there's, there's all kinds of books out there. There's all kinds of teachings out there that sounds right, but it's got leaven in it. And I heard somebody tell me once, well, you know, I was tell, saying that, and they said, well, it's all right to eat the grape and spit out the seed, and it's all right to eat the meat and spit out the bone. And I thought, well, that's cool. And the Lord immediately said, and people choke to death on seeds and bones. Don't they need them? They choke to death. So you, we don't have to read stuff and listen to stuff and view stuff that has mixture in it because we have the truth. So he's given us this ministry of reconciliation. What he's saying there is the same person who has reconciled also restored us to favor with himself. He did the reconciliation and he restored us to, say, uh, to favor. Now this is what I want to show you here. I want to show you what reconciliation means, the word reconciliation. The word reconcile is cat al aso, and it means to change mutually. Now, change mutually means to change me into what you are. That's what it means to me. So he changed us into the what, who and what he is. It comes from al aso, which means to make different. So did he not make man different? He didn't take Adam and fix him. He made him different, a new creation being. And the phrase of reconciliation is cat al age, which means to exchange to adjust and bring restoration to living as the image of Father God. So we do that by giving people the correct information. And the last verse is 2 Corinthians 5, 19. In that manner, because Father God was in Jesus, changing, making different, and new all mankind himself, not taking an inventory, I love this, not taking an inventory, there's side slips, errors, or wrongdoing under them. Who, who takes that inventory? Religion and tradition, right? Right. Religious churches are always what I call sin sniffing. They take an inventory of what you've done and they'll expose it if they can. And to us who possess this infinite awareness of the way, the truth, and the life way of life, raised us to an upright and active position. Donna, go ahead and get ready to stop that, please. Active position of ministry and ordain in a position of rest, which means we're seated together with him, right? The true topic of the Logos. So we're to teach the true topic of the word, and we are equipped with a divine expression of the exchange, atonement, 
and the mutual change of all people. Family, this should make you an evangelist. Yes. This should make you go out into all the world and make disciples of all men because you have a truth. You no longer have to go and say, well, if you died, do you know where you'd be today? You no longer have to say that kind of stuff. You can go you into all your world and set the captive free by teaching the truth. And so I would suggest to you, suggest to you that you take what we're learning and say, Father, send me the people who are ready and send me people to who are asking the right question. And you know what the right question is? The question that you can answer. And you can answer a lot of questions. And when you can answer the questions, they're going to come for more. You agree with me? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Appreciate you.